Thanks again for the invitation. And I'm out here in California. And we, um, uh, the Western Center for Food Safety is uh, actually a, an FDA SIFSAN uh, Academic Center of Excellence. We're, we're one of four. And uh, we actually go beyond the West. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about some collaborative data uh, that actually ties into the manure pathogen survey that, that Manon shared some data as, and as well as some looking at uh, prevalence and concentration of uh, foodborne pathogens in poultry litter and cattle manure, which will probably be of interest to this diverse audience. So just a, a quick overview, Manon uh, uh, did give you some of the, uh, the scary information about the, the bad bugs that we can find in, uh, in animal manures. Uh, we call these, uh, these pathogens zoonotic, enteric foodborne pathogens, meaning that uh, many of them just live naturally in the gut of the animals and, and healthy cattle, healthy cattle on pasture, uh, healthy cattle in, in feedlots, um, they, they will be carrying these pathogens um, not infrequently, and uh, as well as wild animals. And so it's not as simple as, uh, you know, a factory farm or grain feeding. There's, there's a lot of uh, components that go into uh, the movement of, of these pathogens, such as E. coli 0157, STEC, and salmonella that that can get, uh, there can be environmental loading from manure uh, that can then eventually get into the food supply uh, through an, an indirect route, not just through uh, meat content, undercooked meat. So the public health concern with uh, manure and other animal byproducts is then that uh, they can be a vector to spread these pathogens when they're, when they're put out as a fertilizer. Uh, and this can happen on both conventional and organic farms. And that's part of our research is to look at soil health differences and how that might uh, affect uh, these, these, uh, the behavior and die off of these pathogens. And uh, the, um, and uh, uh, also looking at, uh, you know, the other issue is even if you're not using, which we don't out here in California for our uh, more sensitive crops like uh, leafy greens and, and anything else that's eaten raw, um, that's the nature of our, our industry is that um, uh, raw manure is avoided or even prohibited under, under certain uh, marketing agreements. And so you still can have a risk though, if they're adjacent to a, an animal operation that stores manure or a composting operation where they have their, their feed stocks and the potential for runoff or wind or, or uh, equipment moving things around. Uh, so a few definitions. Uh, one is, uh, you've already um, heard this term, but uh, I'll say it again, the, this BSAAO. Um, often we're just referring to raw manure, but it also includes aged or stacked manure. This picture on the right was a, a smaller farm up in the Shasta Cascade, and I went up, I uh, was doing this manure survey, and uh, the owner had grass-fed beef and, and a micro dairy, pastured pigs and poultry, and, and was putting manure into a windrow like uh, pile and she was calling it her compost and when I asked her about um, her the way that she manages the compost pile she said uh, I asked her if she uses a thermometer and how she turns it and I, I got a pretty blank look um, and so I started to find out that um, in, in, in many especially in the, some of the smaller and medium-sized farms um, the word compost has a different meaning to different people and so uh, it has a very specific definition as many of you probably know for uh, regulatory purposes so technically anything aged doesn't matter if it's been sitting there for a hundred years <laughs> or let's say more likely a uh, one year or six months um, if it wasn't didn't go through a process it's raw manure it's, co it's considered a BSAAO same thing with manure slurries, compost teas uh, made with uh, brown material, so-called brown material with manure in them and any soil amendment that's mixed with raw manure. So if it's green waste um, mixed with animal waste, then, then it's a, a BSAAO that's untreated. Um, we see many, many different types of animal manures used. Um, uh, in a survey that we did with organic growers, uh, multi-regional, we found uh, poultry, cattle, and horse being the most common. Uh, in some area regions, horse is, is the most common, especially going in with mixes uh, such as green waste. And um, out here, we also have a lot of exotic um, uh, animal uh, manures being composted uh, from zoos and so on. 
Uh, I'm not going to read this slide, but just again, compost, um, it's used very loosely, even in my house <laughs> when we throw our, have our, our food waste pile. Uh, but it is it, it has to be a scientifically valid process and uh, and that makes a big difference in terms of the requirements like you don't under the FISMA you don't need wait periods um, you can side dress with compost uh, same thing with treated BSAAOs uh, and beyond manure it can be bone blood feather fish emulsion and and uh, very popular are, are these heat treated uh, poultry pellets which in theory, um, have essentially been sterilized, but they're not entirely uh, just pressed uh, uh, poultry manure. There, there can be uh, other additives and stabilizers and some potential for regrowth in any of these. So they may come out clean, but when they get to your farm or into your field, there's that potential of cross-contamination and regrowth. So the, the, the FDA FISMA produce safety rule is what drives our research at Western Center for Food Safety. We share all of our data to inform good policy. And a lot of my work has been focused on the, the BSAAOs as well as uh, animal and, and uh, domesticated animals and wildlife. I am actually part of the veterinary school and a microbiologist. So this, that's how um, veterinarians get involved in food safety um, uh, at the produce level. And again, as, as Manon said, FDA has deferred its decision on these application intervals, and that's why we're collecting all of this data, some of which I'm sharing today. Uh, the NOP, uh, this just shows you again what I had to give this some thought in the beginning. I would have thought that uh, the, 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 um, the, the rule would relate to when you apply the manure and when you plant the crop, but it's actually when you harvest the crop um, is the measurement. And, uh, you know, some people say that these 120, 90 days relate to natural crop cycles, like when you would be fallow or putting your cover crop on and are not based on rigorous scientific information. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's not that we're seeing outbreaks, a lot of outbreaks from, from using raw manure and, and using these intervals. But then again, there's very few root cause analyses that we know at all what caused it. So for that reason, we really want to look closer and, and organizations like the LGMA, which is an industry driven uh, metrics, food safety metrics that, that almost all of our leafy green growers in Arizona and California um, are part of, they pretty much ban raw manure. They've done uh, their scientific review and decided it's just not acceptable for a, a crop that's very sensitive to contamination. And, and if you do get raw manure on a field or you lease a field, you have to wait a year before you can plant it with leafy greens. And we've done quite a few experimental field trials. Um, that's not the data I'm going to show today, but um, just a, as a general uh, overview for you, uh, we, we usually see when we put these um, the, the E. coli inoculum into uh, raw manures, by 30 to 60 to days, almost everything's died off. But then there's this uh, low uh, plateau that where it lasts. And if, it, if you get heavy rains, you can see it uh, regrow or, or be detectable again. Uh, we, uh, this is common sense, but root crops and vegetables growing closer to the ground are at increased risk for transfer than, for example, uh, 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 steak tomatoes um, over plastic mulch. And uh, we do see more survival uh, or higher numbers in uh, a poultry litter over time. So uh, the data that I'm going to show you a little bit from that relates to this group uh, is uh, uh, our prevalence and levels of salmonella survey that we did over over uh, over a year, a little over a year. And this was multi-regional. This was commissioned by FDA. Dave Ingram's on, on the line I saw. He's um, a major contributor to this project and the design. Uh, we worked closely with FDA and, and had subcontracts with uh, University of Delaware, Flo University of Florida, and University of Arizona uh, to uh, basically uh, enroll commercial livestock and poultry farms, as well as composting operations. And, and I have to, uh, you know, this is all done anonymously, but, you know, huge shout, shout out for those brave enough to, to join the study. There's no regulatory implications of, of um, participating in a study like this, but it's scary when you get there and you say, you know, we're being paid by the FDA to, to um, test your manure for pathogens. And so, um, you know, we were really grateful that some people were able to sign up and we've had no breaches in confidentiality. There's, we don't, uh, it's just a given you're going to find uh, pathogens in raw manure, but what we wanted to see is how much. And um, so we collected stored manure less than two weeks old or compost feed stocks um, in most cases. 
Uh, for example, we weren't going into pastures and getting individual fecal pats. Uh, the samples um, were an interesting technique that I had never heard of and, and Dave Ingram shared us. Uh, we collected pile toes, which is basically a surface sample in, in a composite around, around the pile and a pile gut where we went in at different depths into the subsurface and, and uh, collected composite uh, samples. And we would, uh, did that twice a year at our locations. This is a, an extension brochure that we put together um, to explain the project. And we went around um, at meetings and uh, uh, recruiting people across different regions to join. Uh, we had a lot of a variety of different types of operations, some large scale dairies and feedlots. Um, you know, sometimes these windrows can and piles of dairy solids can be, you know, uh, 10 feet high, 25 feet long. Um, but we went to smaller farms too and, and mixed livestock farms um, with, and uh, it had a comparison uh, for that. The, uh, and for poultry, um, we were not really, they don't really pile poultry manure. So we were getting um, composited manure uh, directly off of the conveyor belts and, and uh, on-site storage areas for, for manure that would be treated. So there's uh, just a, a lot, a lot of data here. I, I, I won't, don't have time to go through all of it. The, the bottom line is that um, uh, we had over 90% of, of individual um, farms, virtually every uh, location we enrolled at some point was positive for a pathogen across all four states. And um, we had uh, you know, varying numbers of samples that really you know, depended on how many we could get to sign up, uh, which varied by how nervous people were to, to work on the study. But um, we, we have good data. We found, uh, we did find some STEC 0157, usually at lower levels than non 0157, but um, amazingly, Florida had had higher levels of uh, a, a surprisingly high um, percentage of 0157s. And those will go for whole genome sequencing. And so it'll, it'll be interesting to see. For salmonella, um, again, uh, we uh, uh, had uh, many farms were, were positive that we tested. And in terms of uh, the, the concentration was pretty low for the, the stacks, meaning that, that in those cases, you, you probably those wait periods and composting would, would easily kill off the bacteria. For salmonella, we had some really high uh, values, sometimes up to 10, uh, you know, a million cells per gram at a, a certain location. So we're trying to look at what's going on with that. Um, but the composting process should still work, but with those higher levels in poultry and uh, it could mean that that um, uh, more consideration has to be made in terms of um, these application intervals. So my take home slide is just that there is risk. Um, there's benefits definitely from BSAAOs, even untreated, but they, you do need to have some care and taken when using them. And uh, to, to reduce the risks, um, you know, if, if you want to be conservative and you've got a sensitive crop, then you can just, you know, avoid them and, and compost. Um, if, if uh, uh, and use a, a treated method. If you are gonna use them right now, um, again, we've got uh, the, the intervals that you can apply, the 91, 20 days, but you know, if, you, if, if you're having heavy rain events, um, something different is happening uh, in your environment, then you might consider a longer interval and, and, and eventually we'll, we'll have this great risk assessment model from FDA. These are the many people that have worked on, on it. Um, I, uh, FDA does have a sense of humor, um, BSAAO hitting the fan. Um, <laughs> it's a slide I borrowed from uh, Dave Ingram.